Well, um, a very uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, we're starting dead on time. Uh, no participants are still uh, joining, so I will speak slowly. Um, welcome uh, to this uh, aspect uh, seminar with various universities also supporting it, entitled Building Resilient Communities and Businesses in the New Normal, uh, the Crucial Role of Social Sciences. Uh, my name is Tony Travers from the uh, London School of Economics, and uh, I am this afternoon's chair and indeed will be uh, the first speaker. Uh, as I say, the event is called Building Resilient Communities and Businesses in the New Normal, and I don't need to tell anybody uh, watching and who's about to join in today uh, what a remarkable time uh, we're living in. Uh, this event is uh, scheduled to last to 3.45, and uh, in that time we'll hear a number of contributions, and I'll explain who from in a moment, who the panel is. Uh, it will be possible then to listen to each of them, and then there will be uh, an opportunity to put questions in the Q&A. Uh, a, uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see you can add questions there, which can either be uh, signed or anonymous. And uh, then we will try and take as many of those uh, by the end of the session. So uh, a little word about our panel on this uh, beautiful summer afternoon, or at least it is here. Uh, our panel represent the academic community, knowledge exchange practitioners and industry, and in that sense are a physical representation of the issue that we're about to consider. Um, and joining me on the panel are Professor Douglas Shand of the University of Glasgow, whose research focuses on the economic development of rural areas and who is interested in building resilient local business solutions and developing policy to support owner-occupied operated SMEs. Dr. Rachel Middlemass, uh, my colleague, uh, is a research impact manager at the London School of Economics. She advises researchers on impact strategies and is heavily involved in knowledge exchange, funding and activities. And then uh, last but not least, uh, Peter Jaco, an experienced entrepreneur who's currently chair of two SMEs and co-founder of the Scottish Tech Army COVID-19 Response Force. So um, what I'm going to do now is to, having introduced the speakers, uh, as it were, all in advance, I'm going to speak first, uh, then Douglas, then Peter, then Rachel, and then we'll have the opportunities, opportunities for Q&A. So uh, I'm going to speak now for about five minutes and the other three will speak for about the same. What I want to talk to really is about how stakeholders can come together uh, to innovate and ensure that all communities and individuals benefit. Uh, and of course, we know that the role of government, but not only government, I just want to start with government, has long involved, including um, helping people within an area, businesses in an area, to advance themselves, to do better. This is, in some ways, the, the government has taken on that role, certainly since the evolution of the welfare state, but arguably before it. Universities, on the other hand, uh, were often set up with within cities, they're not only within cities, by local philanthropists and more recently in other ways. And initially, many of those universities were there to underpin industry, to uh, deliver personal fulfillment as the middle classes grew in our industrializing country in the 19th and early 20th century, and of course, as civic partners. So a range of roles for uh, universities and government, all working with the private sector, of course, who deliver the economy, which provides taxation, which allows government to function at all. Now, of course, I think you can argue that we've moved away uh, to some degree from the civic role. We certainly did in the 60s and 70s as the university sector in the UK grew, uh, perhaps away from the civic uh, role of the university, but then latterly, certainly since the last, in the last 15 or 20 years, there's been an increase in demand once again for a civic role for universities and indeed uh, for local authorities. Individual councils, particularly cities and city regions throughout Britain, have become much more conscious of their need to reshape the economy, to work with local business organisations in delivering uh, an economy that works for all of them and for uh, the local area. And of course, 
we've seen a very rapid change, certainly since the 50s, in the sub-national economies in Britain, particularly around cities. Globalisation has changed the economy with a consequent need for a new economy and new skills for individuals. So now we've arrived at the point where government and funding agencies want universities and the private sector to work together much more, city regional level and at other levels, and also because of major one-off issues, or not so one-off in some cases, uh, such as Brexit and COVID-19, which mean that national and local economies are going to be reshaped again. So we're doing all of this, we're discussing today, against the backdrop of large numbers of new businesses being created, the startup culture really has got going in the UK. UK is a great uh, place to set up businesses, lots of inward investment. And so really the purpose of this afternoon is to explore some of these issues in more detail. So having heard from me, my five minutes by way of introduction, I now want to hand over to Douglas in order to talk about his research and what he thinks we need to know from the university point of view. Douglas, over to you. Thanks, Tony. Um, really, I want to talk today a little bit around the, the, the three phases of, of post sort of catastrophe planning. We talk primarily about response, recovery and rebuilding. And I think where social science can have a, a significant impact from a research perspective is on that rebuilding phase. Um, what we need to try and avoid uh, directly is the back to normal thinking um, that's, that's quite prevalent and, and, and is an obvious and kind of clear reaction to a difficult scenario is to think uh, that we can just build back to normal. And actually what we need to do is, is find a way to, to build back to better um, to actually improve uh, the conditions of communities and businesses and the social uh, impact that that's had uh, through those um, natural or, 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 or pandemic type disasters that we're encountering. Um, so the, 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 the response to social science is really dependent upon, sorry, the response from social science is really dependent upon the types of measures that government take when a pandemic such as COVID-19 takes place. And there's been some research done into sort of different aspects of how we're approaching and how we're actually um, reacting to this uh, current pandemic. And th th there's a really nice uh, sort of breakdown uh, into three distinct responses that I've seen, which I think is really interesting. And it's the sort of crushing, crushing contain is the first one which is something that's sort of taking place in, in places like New Zealand and Taiwan, where there's been a very strong and immediate response to, to reduce the impact of, of COVID-19. And then what we've seen in the UK is this idea of, of, of flatten um, and, and actually try and you know, reduce the impact while trying to maintain some semblance of normality for, for business and communities. And then the third one is this sort of you know, constraint and, and support, uh, which we've seen in other, in other communities. And where social science can have an impact from a research perspective is to look at the different impacts that these approaches can have and the reactions and responses that businesses, communities and individuals have under those different uh, situations. Um, what we're starting to see now is some of the sort of recovery trends, um, although we're still you know, in, in the midst of this pandemic, there is uh, some light uh, in terms of recovery. And we're starting to see some trends in different uh, regions, geographies and economies in terms of uh, how we're responding to the situation. And what's really interesting to me is we're starting to see some, some of these recovery trends reflecting what I would call the circular economy. Um, and we're starting to see some growth in that approach to that response. Um, we're obviously limited in our, in our you know, capacities of the systems that ha are impacted by the pandemic, so particularly the healthcare system, will limit the types of approaches that we can put forward for recovery. Um, but I think the circle economy, which is you know, an interesting alternative economic model, is an opportunity for us to address some of those specific issues. And I, I've seen sort of three, three or four specific um, in instances of activities that can really have an impact uh, on communities and businesses and help to build uh, resilience. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting is this idea of, of self-containment and local consumption. 
and that's something that's become very prevalent, um, whether it's, you know, local restaurants suddenly becoming and, and delivering uh, food to local communities through a necessity because their, their businesses are closed, um, or whether it's shortening the supply chain, where we've seen that particularly in, in, in the case of delivering and manufacturing PPE, we've had to reduce supply chain significantly, both in terms of geography and the steps in the supply chain. Um, I thought it was very interesting when one company had been asked to, to, to actually manufacture PPE for, for response and actually the design documents that needed to be used to actually create the PPE uh, didn't exist in the UK. So the, the, the supply chain was so fragmented that the actual design documents that would have allowed machinery to be tooled and ready to build those PPE materials actually weren't available in the UK. They were with the manufacturer, uh, which in this case was in China. So I think you know there's there's, there's a definite um, need to reassess the supply chain and to look at local fulfilment and, and self-containment. You know, consuming locally and using local resources. Um, and and this leads to sort of another aspect of the circular economy, which I think is quite key here, is, is paying for services rather than paying for products. Um, there's an opportunity for communities to start to look at community consumption through services rather than through products. And an example of that would be, you know, at home, we all purchase uh, washing machines so that we can uh, have a product that, that delivers a service in house. But actually we could use the service of a laundromat in the same way, um, which changes the consumption model significantly, opens up opportunities for business and entrepreneurs to be innovative to deliver services. So that, that's another area of that circular economy which helps to feed into that. And then the third one um, that I think we've all seen is, is this capping and realigning of consumption. Um, you know, without a doubt, there's been significant decrease in consumption um, because we've not been able to go out and, and shop and to, 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 to actually buy our groceries or, or products in a simple and easier way. So we've seen an increase in online delivery, but overall we've seen a decrease in consumption. Um, and so I think this model is something that, you know, again, social science can look at the impacts that this can have. So I think there's, there's a great opportunity for social science research to have a significant impact on the re recovery and rebuilding phases of this pandemic and to look at innovative and new ways in which communities and businesses can operate to deliver a recovery uh, and rebuilding phase, which you know, takes us beyond uh, building back to what we are into a much better uh, situation. That's my opening remarks, Tony. Great. Thank you, Douglas. And um, interesting thoughts there, particularly about the way in which the economy can will change, but can be made to change uh, in a better way to work more effectively, and in fact, in a more desirable way for communities and uh, for the environment. And also, it's interesting stuff which I certainly hadn't really thought about in detail about supply chains and the understanding of them and what uh, university research can help us with there. So thanks uh, very much for that. Um, Douglas, and now uh, Peter, over to you. Well, thanks very much, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, coming in from Edinburgh today, a rainy Edinburgh. Um, the, there's some interesting points have been made already, particularly around the changes in, in terms of how communities have been reacting to uh, COVID-19. Uh, as uh, Tony mentioned in his opening remarks, I'm a long-term entrepreneur um, from Canada originally, but I've been in the UK over 30 years and I've uh, formed companies and founded companies and co-founded companies both north and south of, of the border. So I understand the innovation um, networks in, on both sides of both Scotland and the down south. Um, I've also been involved in a number of spin-outs from different universities and um, currently working on projects in Glasgow um, I chair a couple of companies, uh, both of them are spin-outs actually. Uh, one's a spin-out from Coventry University. It's a cybersecurity maritime uh, sector company called CyberOwl. Uh, the second is actually a spin-out from the Catapult uh, network. It came from the Transport Systems Catapult, which is a large-scale simulation company uh, called Immense Simulations. So in both cases, the you know, the, the, we have many, as, as we say in the startup world, recovering academics uh, that are working with us on, on helping to commercialize early stage technologies. Uh, but something I've, I've also been involved in um, specific to the COVID-19 um, response is that my, a friend, a, a fellow entrepreneur, friend of mine based up here in Edinburgh, 
uh, we were discussing what we could do with all the talent uh, that was uh, languishing as people unfortunately had been furloughed as part of the shutdown. And we, we came up with this idea that we created a volunteer uh, COVID-19 reaction force, uh, which we named the Scottish Tech Army. One of the pro bono roles I have is actually working with the Scottish government. They have a very active GovTech program, uh, which is called CivTech. I've been on their advisory board for about three years. Uh, so I knew the uh, director and um, the other people that run this program. And we pitched this idea back on the 4th of April um, to the Scottish government. Um, they were very much in favor of, of, of trying to work with, with us. Um, we effectively launched the Scottish Tech Army on the 28th of April through Slater. Um, three months on from there, it's, it's been a remarkable sense of community that we've created. Uh, we have over a thousand volunteers that have come in uh, from a broad spectrum of, of um, and not only Scottish, uh, we've got people from around the world now. Um, and we've, uh, we're actually in the process of delivering, uh, we have over 130 projects in play, uh, many of them for the Scottish charity sectors and also working with the Scottish government. But both Tony and Douglas uh, mentioned some key points um, about, you know, kind of circular economy. And we, we've seen that a lot, particularly in the charitable sector, where um, overnight uh, either people were furloughed or they didn't have access to um, data or tools or the equipment or simply didn't have the skill sets available. And through the volunteer network, we've been able to uh, create and, and work with a number of these charities to help them actually address the circular economy issues, uh, both through flying PPE, uh, through marshalling volunteers um, and, and you know, attending and distributing um, supplies from, from food banks. Um, there's been um, support services offered to uh, Violence Against Women and Girls, a, a Scottish charity that specializes in abused women and their families. Um, so there's been a number of these roles that have really brought people together. So the sense of community um, that we've seen as a result of COVID-19 has been, I have to say, humbling. Uh, it, it really has kind of overwhelmed us uh, with the amount of kind of civic pride people are taking, but also the fact that, that you know, this, you know, we need to, you know, to Douglas's point and Tony's points, I, I don't like the term the new normal. I, I think it's, it's just the way the world is now. And we just have to get used to the masks and all the inconvenience of it all. But, you know, I, I think there has been a, a, we've hit pause. There's time to reflect, uh, not just on the commercialization model, uh, which I'm still looking at with, with various university spin outs. Um, but, you know, right the way through the, the kind of, and if you like, the venture supply chain as well. I work with, very closely with a lot of venture providers, private equity people. I understand the funding models. Um, and you know, we're starting to see some of the significant changes that are actually um, helping uh, British industry. And you know, regardless of, of your views on Brexit, and uh, personally, I'd rather uh, things stay the same way. Uh, but it, it's, um, you know, we, we need to step up. We need to rebuild our economy. And, and the way to do that is to really support a number of early stage businesses. Even within the Scottish Tech Army, we've actually helping to marshal uh, people both to uh, respond and apply to the current uh, Civ Tech program, which is a government technology uh, call that I mentioned, but also think about spinning out their own companies. You know, Beth Alistair Forbes and I, uh, the co-founder, are very keen to, um, to encourage entrepreneurship at the early level. And, and we all have a duty of care of course, to, to the hundreds uh, of people who, who would not be going back to work, um, and it's gonna be thousands more and as we enter the deepest recession we've ever been. So in the Scottish Tech Army, we're pivoting. We're gonna be pivoting into a skills development agency uh, where we're gonna take people who are recent university graduates, recent Code Clan graduates, which is a Scottish uh, uh, skills development um, uh, lab, and help them actually work on real uh, live uh, technology projects, uh, so by in 12 to 18 months time as we start to emerge uh, from this recession we will have hundreds of people who are skilled engineers and ready to contribute uh, to the recovery of society one of the big goals we really want to do in, in terms of a positive outcome uh, for the army is to actually digitize the third sector um, the and, and also of course work with the scottish government and skills development scotland and elsewhere on, on as i say getting people ready for for um, the next, the next uh, recovery is we have to be positive. Uh, we have, a, we also have a duty of care, and this I think is where things have really changed during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Is that people are stopping? Um, they're not traveling as much. They're thinking of others, and certainly uh, what we've seen is that um, many, many hundreds of people want to try and make a difference uh, to the communities in which they live. Thank you.
Okay, Peter, and um, thank you too. Uh, again, a series of fascinating observations and uh, prompts to thinking. I mean, not least of which is how uh, at the end of all of this, if there is ever an end of all of this, uh, we take advantage of some of the community strengthening benefits that have occurred, uh, whilst you know uh, still being able to innovate and create new companies and you know to keep uh, people or get people back into new jobs via the training that's going to be needed uh, from pretty well now on. So thank you for that. And um, last but not least, of course, Rachel. Thank you, Tony, and hello to everybody. Uh, so I was asked to just say a few words about the practicalities for um, KE professionals in achieving impact in this context. Um, as we heard from Douglas, there definitely are opportunities for us all to kind of build back better in the new normal, those things that have been damaged by COVID-19. Um, and social scientists have a powerful role to play in that if they choose to take it. Uh, they might not produce very much by way of kind of patentable widgets, but the social sciences do support uh, analysis, interpretation, um, provide evidence that can provide a basis for decisions by businesses and communities as well as policymakers. I think they also have a role to play in making sure that the voice of communities affected by particular issues are actually represented in discussions of those issues. So um, I'm working with researchers at the LSE at the minute on a couple of projects. One who was working with communities on reconciliation in the Balkan states um, and others looking at regeneration in Brazilian favelas. And the impact of those sorts of projects really particularly include making sure that the communities themselves are able to be represented in and contribute to decisions affecting them and their futures. All of that means that social scientists can help us build back in ways that address long-term and structural problems as well as kind of more immediate issues. Um, and they can also help policymakers and our STEM colleagues develop solutions that people are able and actually willing to follow through on. So again, one might think of work by social scientists on effective and um, acceptable delivery of mass vaccination programs, which might soon be highly relevant. Uh, more generally, the contribution that social scientists make to improving the resilience of our democracies, protecting our natural environments, uh, promoting good mental health, uh, will all no doubt remain vital in the new normal, whatever that looks like. Um, at LSE, we're supporting a programme of research on COVID-19, um, and next month we'll launch a new programme called Shaping the Post-COVID World, which will convene debate about the direction the world could and should take from here, which is obviously really rele relevant to what we've been talking about today. That programme is including themes such as restructuring business trade in the future of work, government, state capacity, democracy and rights, as well as issues relating more directly or more obviously directly to healthcare. And the point here is that there really is a good opportunity at this moment to improve resilience in both communities and in businesses by rebuilding things the right way, as Douglas said, rather than just the normal way. Lots of other institutions, I'm sure, will be running really similar programmes. And there are a number of practical challenges for all of us that I can see uh, in responding to COVID in ways that let us deliver the sorts of benefits that Douglas and Peter and Tony have talked about already. So in the couple of minutes that I have left, I'm just going to very briefly mention four of those practical challenges that I can see, uh, namely around collaboration, visibility, credibility and incentivization. So first, collaboration. To be effective, of course, all of this work involves collaboration, not just with businesses and communities and indeed policymakers, but also between and even within academic disciplines. Um, I think the silos between academia and other sectors are quite well documented, but there are also challenges even within the ivory towers, as all of us who work there will know. So lots of academics don't know what the person in the office next to them is doing, let alone colleagues in other departments or, you know, God forbid, other universities. That's, of course, not universally true, but often it is. Uh, it's also worth noting that the stakeholders that we're talking about academics being expected to work with, communities, industry, policymakers, are really different. They have different needs, they have different timescales, they're interested in different academic angles and outputs. And to accommodate that, we really need to increase the support that we provide to researchers in reaching out to and working with them. Um, just as a kind of side note to that, I'd really love to see more proactivity on the kind of demand side of that equation rather than the supply side, i.e. the academic side. So more external partners coming to universities for help. But of course, part of the problem with that is the second challenge around visibility um, and also to some extent accessibility. So even if businesses or communities or policymakers or whoever it is know that 
they have a problem or a challenge that would benefit from academic input, it's often really difficult for them to know who and where to go to for that. Um, I think that's true in a general sense for all researchers in all universities, which tend to be kind of impenetrable mazes of confusing acronyms and divisions with names that don't tell you what they actually do. But it's perhaps particularly problematic for social scientists because most people don't know what social scientists are and they don't know what they do. So if social science research is to, receive, to achieve the same kind of prominence as STEM and the same recognition of what it can do for communities and businesses, I think we really need to up our visibility. Um, for that reason, I'm really pleased that the LSE was recently, recently involved along with the British Academy in launching the SHAPE initiative, which stands for Social Sciences, Humanities and Arts for People and the Economy. And the whole point of that is to try and level up the visibility of those disciplines as compared with STEM. Uh, the third challenge that I mentioned there is credibility. Um, I mean, experts generally have had a hard time of things in the last decade or so. Uh, possibly fairly, economists and political scientists have taken a particular pounding in that, um, notably after the financial crash. Uh, part of rehabilitating social science expertise, I think, is getting much better at tracking, evaluating and describing the impacts of social science research. It's really hard to draw even correlative, let alone causal links between specific impacts and specific social science research projects or papers. That's almost universally true, but it does make it really hard to prove the nature and value of the contribution that that research is making. Um, so to rise to that challenge, I think we need to get better at evaluation, better at communicating the benefits of social science work, even or especially when that benefit can't be counted in kind of pounds, shillings and pence. Finally, I think there's a challenge with incentivization um, and particularly with incentivizing individual academics to do any of this difficult kind of KE stuff, a lot of which is fairly significantly beyond the comfort zone of, of a lot of researchers. Um, there are fairly obvious incentives for institutions to get involved. They're clearly thinking of their reputations, possibly they're thinking of the opportunities that it creates to access funding, but there's not so much incentivization for individual researchers especially for academics who are already tasked with delivering high quality research and teaching, doing anything else with anyone else for any other reason can often feel like a burden too far, even if they're kind of theoretically keen for their research to make a difference. So to address that, I think we need to get better at incentivizing and rewarding KE because really nobody is gonna do it well if nobody's doing it at all. Um, I don't wanna finish on quite such a bleak note though so I'm just going to end by saying that there is really a huge opportunity at this point for the social sciences to rise to all of those challenges and make a big difference and actually become more resilient themselves in doing that. Thank you. Okay Rachel that's great and uh, a timely reminder both on the optimistic front that um, you know thing, issues such as vaccination, social science and STEM will have to work closely together but also a timely warning that uh, there are barriers. And indeed, uh, I've got a first question in the Q&A, and I'm going to come to that in a moment. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A, and I'll try to get to them all in the 16 or 17 minutes we've got. So feel free to add another one, or somebody else would like to add some. But just to uh, ask the panel, um, given that Rachel touched on it at the end, clearly there are different incentives affecting or influencing business uh, and universities. And I don't know which of you'd like to go first. Um, I mean, Douglas, you're in a university, you're an expert, you're, you're part of the, and, and I thousand percent agree with Rachel about, you know, people in, even inside universities may not be that great at uh, collaborating still less within with the private sector. So Douglas, what's your experience of the kind of incentives that work for your colleagues, our colleagues in universities to help them look out more? I, I think structuring the, 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 the collaborative impact of, of KE uh, in, into um, you know, personal development planning within the university is obviously key and fundamental to to that you know, shift in, in, in how people behave and how they respond. I think it's also tied to something Rachel mentioned, which was the demand side. I think if there was a, a high demand externally for the, the experience and skills and knowledge and capabilities of academics in a structured fashion, it would allow them to tie into you know, high impact public sector type projects 
um, in a much more effective fashion. And I think that's where something like uh, the Scottish Tech Army, CivTech, and there are many, many other initiatives to help to create demand for the skills that our social scientists have and the ability to do high quality research that can have a fundamental impact on those uh, external bodies, uh, whether the public sector, third sector, or, or you know, even, even uh, social science focused you know, startups, which we're starting to see. So I, I think it's a combination of those two things. It's, it's making sure it's structured within the, 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 the career development planning for, for academics, but also making sure that they see there's a real clear and strong demand for their skills externally and that they can get involved in that. Okay, great. And um, can I just sort of flip it around to you, Rachel. You, you mentioned that we've just picked it up. I mean, uh, we've talked about this, uh, you know, at, within the school a number of occasions. Some, some academics find it very easy to leap into the world of knowledge exchange and it's finding those that might be interested and can easily be in, encouraged and sort of tempting them out there to show them that there are real benefits in terms of you know personal interest and self-fulfillment. Is that, is that right? Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, I mean I agree with everything Douglas said and, and seeing more of that kind of demand side interest in what academics can offer I think would be a good way of tempting some of those people out of the no, not the woodwork, the shade, um, and encouraging them into the limelight. Uh, I mean, the bottom line is that people at the minute need uh, money, though possibly not as much of it as we sometimes think that they do. We see really successful knowledge exchange projects starting from very small amounts of seed funding. Um, they do need time and they do need support. Uh, and you know, I think they need the, the time and energy that they put into knowledge exchange to be recognized by their institutions, whether that's through formal personal development planning mechanisms, as Douglas uh, mentioned, or just by communicating um, with enthusiasm the, the impacts that we have. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a question in the chat about the REF, and maybe we'll come on to that later, but certainly oh, well, that's a general driver that, that can help or hinder, depending on how they do it. right now, as you're on the stage, Rachel, I'll answer the question, because it's to you. Certainly, when name check the, um, I think it's the person who's put the, um, oh, it's disappeared, actually. Do you want to answer the one about the REF? Do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure I can answer all of it, but um, certainly in terms of the work, the effects that the ref has on, on this, however... I think what the ref is, just for those who are online who might, I'm sure we all know, but just in case there's anybody who's not on top of the ref. So sure, if there's anyone whose life has not yet been um, <laughs> by the ref, it's the research expert <laughs> framework happens once every six-ish years, pandemics notwithstanding, and it's basically everyone turns in their homework and uh, it gets assessed to see who gets what money for the following six or so years. Um, and one component of that is research impact, uh, assessed through impact case studies. Um, lots of people, I think it's fair to say, don't love the REF for lots of reasons. It uh, certainly takes up a lot of time and energy within universities. But however you feel about it, the inclusion of impact within it has driven the idea of knowledge exchange and impact and applied research much further up to the agenda than it was previously uh, has given it greater prominence, has given it at least a little bit more kind of respectability um, within uh, some parts of the universities where it was previously perhaps looked down on a little bit. Um, and the introduction of the knowledge exchange framework and the knowledge exchange Concord app, both of which are planned for later this year, may open that up further, maybe another way of encouraging individuals to um, engage with this agenda depends a bit on how sensitively how um, seriously universities engage with those as exercises okay great thanks for that so i'm going to go uh, peter i'm not ignoring you i'm just going to go straight into the questions with one for you um partly because um you hinted at one you're running at the moment, or not, I'm a hint to describe one you're involved with at the moment. But there's a question from Zabina O. I hope I pronounced your name uh, properly there. And I'll come back to the others in a moment who put questions up. What are good examples of sex successful social sciences spin-outs? It sounds as if uh, your Scottish tech army um, was one of those, but are there others that uh, you could, I mean, say more about that or others you, you're aware of? Yeah, hi, and thanks for the question. I, I think the, the Scottish Tech Army wasn't a spin-out as such. It was really just an, a, a concept. An idea. That, 
Okay. Yeah, my friend and I came up with and pitched to the Scottish government and we got very quick traction on and as I say, you know, thousand people, hundred plus projects in three months. It just shows what can be done by a sense of community during very challenging times and giving people that sense of purpose. But I think there is more social engagement um, that we're starting to see across the startup sphere. Uh, we recently, Google, as of yesterday, just announced a new um, sustainability bond. Amazon's launched a sustainability fund. There's literally billions and billions of, of dollars being poured into, um, you know, greener, more sustainable, more socially conscious uh, economy. Uh, we're seeing more start, more firms actually becoming sort of B Corp. So they, they bestride both purpose uh, with profit. Uh, but, you know, th there's still a lot of challenges to come. And, and you know, just back to the ref, I, I've been working on the kind of the spin outside and trying to accelerate and commercialize early stage companies for a long time from universities. And, you know, there's some real challenges there because there's um, across the UK, in my view, there's a, a lack of, if you like, Americanization or maturity view. I know UCL and Imperial are, are very up to speed in terms of taking you know, views on, on, you know, what kind of equity to retain, for example. But there's other uh, universities and institutions across the country that just aren't. You know, if, they, if a university tells me they want to retain 50% equity, they don't have a company. Uh, it simply is an, an unsustainable. And there's, and even here in Scotland, there's a wide range of, uh, you know, depending on the commercialization structure. So I'd like to see standardization there. Um, I'd like to see more training and education of academics about how to actually uh, focus on impact and spin outs. I think there could be more early stage funding. If anything, as a trend, the venture community has moved away from the very early stage um, and investments. Um, it's left really to a lot of unsophisticated angels who are looking at tax breaks through um, you know, seed enterprise investment schemes or you know, larger stage angels with enterprise investment schemes. So um, it, it, there's more we could do generally. And it's also uh, the last point I'd make on that. And this does embrace all the social aspects as well, is how can the universities provide more visibility on the research that they're doing? I ran an IP commercialization company for many years, and we went around the world and meeting with all sorts of universities from you know, China, um, all over Asia and, and um, America and, and Europe. And it, it was it, mainly it was very difficult. We found out we would go in and tell them the research we were interested in rather than them being able to give us a portfolio. Or a very or a lot of clarity and depth over the sort of areas of expertise that they had in our particular sector. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, we've got some more questions. I'm going to come to in a second. One of which I need to respond to because it's aimed at me, I think. But uh, given that Scotland and London are well represented on the panel, any examples or anything you can put in the Q and A from uh, cities or not cities out in the rest of the country would be good. If anybody might encourage. Uh, non-Scotland and non-London participants to join in. I think Hitesh Patel, your question was uh, answered by Rachel and has been touched on by Peter. Um, now, this is a question from Tony Roach. Many thanks to the panel and, and so on. Uh, research to impact journey can take many years to come to fruition. It's fraught with measurement challenges. What milestones might we look for and how can these be associated with underpinning scholarly outputs? So I think that's um, actually not a million miles from the question that was aimed at me about my assertion that academics are not keen on KEI. And I think I meant that there's a sort of normal distribution. Some are very interested, some less so. But for those who are less so, to take Tony Roach's uh, question, this long period for that academic research can take compared with the short term needs often of businesses and even government. Uh, I mean, Rachel, is there a, do you have advice on this before I get deeper into it? Um, it's difficult. The, the very unsatisfactory advice that I often end up giving people is that there aren't universal milestones or there aren't, it's not very really helpful for me to set sort of generalized um, touch points or milestones or whatever, it has to be kind of tailored to the, what they're trying to do and what they're trying to achieve. But I guess in very broad general terms, we move from uh, dissemination through to engagement through to impact. And there are generalized terms about uh, kind of attention and, and uptake uh, that we might measure at each of those stages before things are translated into more tangible impact. Okay, great. And um, Douglas, do you want to add to this? This one, I've kept you out for a second, so do come back. No, 
Thanks, Tony. I, I think there's, you know, as you mentioned, there's a balance across, you know, everyone's uh, research interests in terms of how much direct impact they have on, on, you know, opportunities within commercial, you know, translation into business opportunity. Um, I think someone's, you know, suggested in the questions also that, you know, we need to be uh, asking, you know, business in the public sector and the third sector to to, to help to create that demand. Uh, and I think that's that's starting to become more prevalent as we see uh, organisations, in, particularly in the public sector, take on some of the structures and some of the processes that commercial business do to generate innovation, innovative you know requirements. And I think that will have an impact. And that's you know Peter mentioned CivTech, and I think in Scotland that works really well, and it works across the world. There are a number of you know CivTech implementations across the globe. Uh, and, and that focuses the mind and focuses the demand for specific research and input into uh, you know, business solutions that will ultimately become commercially useful. Uh, and I think that's really helping to do that. And I think we're starting to see those to, to bring in your regional kind of requirement there. We're starting to see a lot of these uh, requirements from public sector become more regionally focused, where the demand is, is, is different from you know, whether it's London or Manchester or Birmingham or the Central Belt of Scotland, where we've got very specific needs in the regional sector that often are, are not addressed by startups and spin outs. Um, so I think that's helping as well. And I think a move to you know, regionalize some of these organizations so that they have a footprint in the regions and can start to generate demand for regionally specific solutions that local businesses can adopt and, and can try and you know, develop solutions for. And I think that will be a key part of um, us starting to move towards a more circular economy and addressing some of the issues that COVID-19 and that localization, which is one of the things that I think is really key and really important. You know, we need to create local demand, but we also need to create you know, structures and frameworks, businesses and partnerships and collaborations that can deliver solutions locally also. Great. Now, Helen Baxter asked the question, do we need to negotiate a new social contract? We're going to have to wrap up in the next two or three minutes. This is an interesting question, which I think, I don't, hope I'm not misquoting you, Helen, or misquoting your intent in this uh, fascinating question. Sort of, do we need to, and let me interpret it slightly, is do the panellists, perhaps as a close, in closing thought, need to think slightly more differently about the way uh, social sciences in universities, businesses and the third sector and startups uh, within both the commercial and the not-for-profit sector sort of think about social relationships? I mean, Peter hinted at this, so perhaps if I can come to you first, about whether as we move through into, in fact, all of the three speakers did, as we move forward into the future, do we need some sort of new social contract between elements of society? Well, thanks, Tony. I, I think, and, and thank you everyone for having me on the call. I, I'm pressing a stay as I'm optimistic that that is already happening. There's a kind of, an, we're seeing that through not just the engagement of the Scottish Czech Army, but there've been a number of uh, volunteer um, it, it, you know, startups throughout the country where utilizing furloughed or unemployed skills and, and people voluntarily giving their time and huge amount, hundreds of hours in, in many cases and, and really trying to make a difference. So I, 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 you know, we're seeing that and we'd like to see more of it and I'm, I am optimistic that we will come through this. Very good, thank you. Um, Rachel. I'm going to keep my answer really short, mindful of time, and just say yes, I think we do. I think we all have a duty to learn more about what we can do for each other. That was short. Excellent. Douglas. Yeah, I, I agree with Peter and Rachel. I think we've got a fantastic opportunity re to renegotiate that social contract between us all, You know, whether we're academics, whether we're working in the private or the public sector. Uh, looking at communities, both in the regions and in cities, I think there's a fantastic opportunity for all of us to reflect on what's happened, what opportunities and what doors that opens up, and how we can move towards a, a new social contract that really embraces change and gives us all a fair and, and equal opportunity. Very good. Admirably short, all three of you. Wonderful panellists. Uh, thank you. Now, um, there's one question I, I, I'm not going to put to you because we're running, we've run out of time, but Mohamed 
Shahid Imran was asked an interesting question towards the end about the extent to which natural hazards and now COVID-19 change the perspective we social scientists you know, have a, about resilience. You know, how uh, thinking about this disaster, he says, uh, will it be okay is different from when we said the same kind of thing in the context of you know, floods, because we can't say things will be okay uh, with this one. It, it does act, I think, COVID-19 as a prompt to all of us, and I'm going to use uh, this question as a prompt to making this point in closing, um, that I think we do now realise that more than any time in all our lifetimes, we do have to think differently uh, about the future, and that this presents, uh, as ever, opportunities as well as threats to those working in universities, in STEM subjects and social science, in the private sector who work with those in universities and those who work in the not-for-profit sector, again, with the other two, uh, for the advancement of society. So uh, I think all three of our panellists today have with admirable um, succinctness and across a wide range of subjects, help us dig into this subject a little more. There's clearly an enormous further amount of um, amount to be said about all of this. Uh, a question came at the end asking whether this is being recorded. Well, it's certainly being recorded on screen. So uh, I think if anybody, I, I'm now be making a terrible mistake here, but I think if anybody would like to see a copy of the recording, uh, you can at least, um, uh, it will be sent afterwards, Adam has added. So uh, there we are, I'm uh, being helped in real time here. So uh, the recording will be made available for anybody who had to log off earlier. And actually seeing Adam's name there, in addition to my panellists, Douglas, Peter and Rachel, I just want to thank um, Adam Richards Gray who and others at Aspect who stood behind putting this event together this afternoon. Uh, I'm sure we'll return to these kind of subjects very, very soon, all of us in different ways. So uh, thank you everybody. And I suspect that uh, in a few seconds in the best traditions of these events, as if we haven't paid the electricity bill, the screens will all suddenly go dead at once. Doesn't mean uh, it's for a bad thing. It's just that we've come to the end of our afternoon more or less on time. Thank you everybody. Thanks for joining in from wherever you are in the UK and beyond. Uh, thanks once again to our panelists and a very good afternoon to you. Have a nice August. <laughs>